Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of Synergistec's 2020 virtual user conference. I'm Michelle Drake, Privacy Services Specialist with Synergistic. We sure hope you enjoyed yesterday's sessions. We heard from Caleb Barlow, our CEO, on handling incidents during a pandemic. We had two ethical hackers with some thought-provoking information, learned about what's changed since COVID-19, shared insights from a security and privacy perspective about the benefits of collaboration. And for any of those of you that may have missed some of our sessions yesterday, know that they're available under the sessions tab. All have been recorded for your review at your convenience. So following this morning's keynote, we have two breakout se sessions. One will be with Synergistics' Dave Bailey. Dave will share insights from our annual report that was sent to your inboxes this morning as well as another breakout session on medical device security. We have a case study for you. After the break, we'll learn how to think like a cybersecurity adversary with our Synergistic Red Team experts. And then we'll conclude our day with Eric Decker from University of Chicago Health, as well as Synergistic's David Finn for final thoughts, yours, mine, and ours. So we do have a couple of housekeeping items, just a moment here. You'll notice on the right side of your screen, you have the opportunity to chat um, please use the chat feature for any kind of general information. We should be sharing our slides in the chat area for you. Also, we have a Q&A tab. If you have any questions for Nick, our keynote speaker, please use that Q&A tab, and we'll cover those closer to the end of our discussion this morning. And then the polls tab, we'll use that later in the show on how we did. There's a satisfaction that will be later in the show. You can also click to full screen so you can see all of Nick's slides. There's a bottom right computer icon just use that to go to full screen. So that's it for housekeeping. So let me welcome all of you to our main stage event, Privacy Threats in Healthcare. It could happen to you. So in this session, Nick will examine how data breaches affected the healthcare industry according to the 2020 Breach Barometer Report and what steps you can take to protect your institution now. This session will include the current health data security threat landscape and the emerging trends from 2019, some practical steps your teams can use to protect patient privacy and gain an understanding of healthcare compliance analytics and how that data can be used to monitor, detect, and prevent healthcare data breaches. So I'd like to welcome Nick and Penny. Nick Culbertson is the co-founder of and CEO of Pretenis. In 2014, Nick and his co-founder, Robert Lord, many of you met Robert Lord during last year's Synergistic event in Austin, Texas, where we had the pleasure of being live versus virtual. Um, so Nick and Robert developed the initial prototype and algorithms that launched Pretenis, fulfilling a critical need to advance health data security and better protect patient data, which is near and dear to all of us, I'm certain. We're happy to have him here today and recognize Pretenis as one of our partners in helping us deliver our patient privacy monitoring service. Let me turn the session over to you, Nick. Nick, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Michelle. I really appreciate that, that kind introduction. Uh, and thank you everyone for taking the time today to listen to this presentation. Um, you know, I, I, many of you may have heard Robert, my co-founder last year. I wanted to open up and introduce everyone to our other partner, Penny. Um, she uh, is one of our employees, Chief Happiness Officer. She's in the office with, with us every day and really commits on her role of, of keeping the company happy and, and engaged. And, um, you know, she's a very active participant of our user group conference and, and involved with many of our, our customer conversations as well. So I thought I'd bring her here and introduce her just to get everyone's attention uh, and warm up. And also because, like so many of you, I'm, uh, we're both working from home and Penny misses being around a lot of her friends. So I thought I'd bring her up here today and at least have everyone get a good snapshot of her. So please, uh, um, any questions you have for myself or Penny, we're happy, we're happy to answer. So I'm going to jump into this presentation. As Michelle, Michelle said, please uh, feel free to chat or comment on questions. I'm going to run through the whole presentation and then take questions at the end. Questions are always my favorite part because it's really interesting to hear where you guys are thinking and, and, and where we can really provide more value from this presentation. Um, the beginning of this presentation is going to be covering our breach barometer. For those who are not familiar, the Pretenis Breach Barometer is an independent report that we've been producing for a couple of years now. And to our knowledge, it's the only report that's combining um, government data from Health and Human Services as well as publicly available data that we aggregate and analyze the entire spectrum of, of the health data security landscape. 
So that's going to be the first part of our agenda is going through that that whole landscape and looking at the trends. Some really interesting uh, information here on how things, some things in our industry are getting better, other things are are actually getting worse. And so I hope this information can help you think about your own privacy and security programs um, and, and where efforts are best directed. We're then going to take that information and talk about practical steps um, that your team can use to help improve protection around patient privacy. And finally, how the concept of healthcare compliance analytics uh, can um, support those initiatives around patient privacy uh, as well. So I'll start off uh, our talk with the breach barometer with the biggest um, statistic. Um, over 41 million patient records were affected in 2019. Uh, this number is so astronomically high that it, in, some time, in some ways it's really hard to contextualize the importance of your roles and the, and the value that you bring. The fact that this many patients are, are, are exposed and their information is, is released for either um, nefarious or even benign ways it's just really detrimental, not only to the patient, but the organizations that you all work at and the responsibilities you have to keep these patients safe. So numbers is sometimes um, you know, difficult to, to comprehend. So I thought I'd look at this from a different perspective. And I wanna ask you guys to let me know what you think these three gentlemen have in common. So if you can, drop a note in the chat. I'd love to see what you guys think. Um, what is in common with these folks. Uh, if your answer is that they are all handsome gentlemen, um, you are two thirds correct. Um, but I'd love to hear what you guys think. No one has any comments. I know you're all thinking things. Um, I bet many of you are thinking the correct answer, which is the thing that these three gentlemen have in common is that they are all exposed to the COVID-19 um uh virus and uh, there was a lot of social media attention around the fact that they were diagnosed um you know the way that their diagnosis was exposed was not necessarily controlled by the individual um and the way that the media swarmed um was uh was concerning uh and i bring this up because the situation we're in with the the global pandemic creates a unique challenge for privacy and security that you all are all too familiar with. Uh, we are limited in resources due to the, the economic impact and fallout of the pandemic, but at the same time, we are, if anything, way overexposed um, to the increasing number of threats. Uh, across the board, we've seen um, an increase in, in ransomware, an increase in, in phishing attacks. And because a lot of resources are being constrained, what we're seeing is, is this is creating more risk. And I, I think when we look at the 2020 breach barometer, we're going to see that things have gotten a lot worse and, and we're taking a step back in a number of ways, which is really unfortunate. So I, I can't stress enough the importance of all of your roles and the responsibilities that you have. Synergistic has been a, a tremendous thought leader in this. There's been a number of, of really interesting articles that are already starting to see the trends on, on how cybersecurity and privacy threats are increasing this pandemic. Um, and I just remind you all to, to um, remain vigilant and, and really kind of incorporate the current circumstances. That being said, a lot of today's presentations is gonna be focusing on 2019. Um, our analysis is based on 572 health data breaches that were reported by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and in the media, as well as some other sources that we've been able to aggregate, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, in the past year, uh, in the years past, we do not have the numbers of every incident in 2019, but for those uh, 481 incidents that we do have data, there were 4 million patients that were impacted, as I mentioned earlier. This is a monthly breakdown of the total disclosed incidents. And you can see um, there's not really a seasonality trend here. There's not a time where um, you know, we're, we're not exposed to cybersecurity or, or privacy threats. It really is persistent year round. And, and the fluctuations you see here are relatively random, um, if anything. I just want to remind everyone that why we think this is the most comprehensive analysis of um, 
uh, incidents in, in healthcare. We don't think this is at all representative of the total threats. Uh, we think that this is really just the tip of the iceberg, and there's a lot of other incidences that are going on undetected, which we'll talk a little bit about later. So comparing these to prior years, you can see that there's a staggering increase in the number of affected patient records. In 2019, the number almost tripled compared to 2018 data. Uh, looking out broadly, you can see that this number has even been increasing over further years. It does kind of wax and wane from, um, from every few collection of years, but generally it's getting worse. I mentioned earlier why the overall picture is getting worse. There is some good news and, and some good success buried within that, and we're going to touch on that here in a few minutes. Despite the innovations of healthcare appliance analytics, the healthcare industry has continued to experience an increase in number of reported records and data breaches. Um, since Pretenna started com and compiling statistics in 2016, this is an alarming trend which should ch uh, change as more organizations deploy advanced privacy monitoring. And we really think this can get better, but the bottom line is, is regardless of the number of patient records or um, the total disclosed, either way you cut it, things are not getting better. Looking at how this is distributed across the United States, about 96% of states have been, uh, have been represented in this data set of the 50, 570 incidents. So that's about 48 states um, based on the location where the incident was reported. Texas had the most reported incidents with 59, followed by California, uh, with 49. But uh, a couple things to note about this, this chart. Um, the numbers from states are inflated because analysis used by the states uh, where the BAA and vendor uh, was located and not where the client was located. Um, so they're, where the actual records were impacted may not follow this graph as well. I'll also point out that this is the number um, uh, of incidents and not normalized to population density. And as you can see, um, just knowing the, the geographic breakdown of the United States, you can see the darker areas are more heavily populated areas in the US. And um, my interpretation from looking at the um, normalization of this graph is that really anyone is at risk. There's not a part of the US or a type of organization that's not exposed. And while every health system is not treating um, you know, movie stars like Idris Elba or, or Tom Hanks, everyone has exposed um, to um, patients that are mentioned in the media or just any patient that could be exposed. Um, we're seeing a lot of hospitals have concerns, especially now uh, with COVID-19, where they're creating dashboards of individuals that, that have been diagnosed with the, with the virus. And it's making it really easy to look up. So if you want to know if your neighbor has the, the, um, the virus, people are using that, these kind of data sharing dashboards um, to uh, further violate uh, people's privacy just to you know, protect themselves. The single largest uh, data breach reported in 2019 was due to hacking, uh, and it actually involved a business associate, not a covered entity. It involved one of the car country's largest patient collections recovery agency um, that had its patient's information accessed by an unauthorized party. The breach was discovered when analysts found personally identifiable information, including date of birth, social security number, and physical address of sales available on the dark web. It's really unfortunate that the way that this was detected was actually seeing the fallout of the information um, somewhere else and actually not the infiltration or the departure of the information from the organization. The hackers appeared to gain access to the information through an online patient portal over the course of several months, beginning in September of 2018 and continuing um, persistently through March of 2019. So this hacking incident actually affected 20 million, um, which, is, which is over half of the uh, uh, patient records that were incident. So it really is large. Um, 11.9, um, I believe, million of those records were affected just by one client uh, of the business associate. So just to, to show that um, one incident can have a tremendous magnitude um, uh, oh, it started on the slide. I'm sorry, 11.9. That was right. 
um, of, of, of uh, patients being impacted. So it's, it's that combination of large devastating effects, but then really uh, large volumes of small incidents as well. So it, it should be obvious that, that hacking is the biggest contributor of, of these um, types of incidents that we've seen in 2019. Um, there were incidents of hackers attempting to extort money from the, bre um, from the breach patients, not just the affected healthcare organizations. So we saw ransomware hitting uh, healthcare organizations, but also outreach to patients. In one incident, hackers gained access to patient information and made the typical ransom demand of the breach organization. Um, in a new malicious move, the hackers also sent ransom demands to a number of the affected patients, threatening the public release of their photos and personal information unless uh, unspecified ransom demands were um, um, uh, are negotiated and met. This is actually currently being investigated by the FBI and is an ongoing case. We, we think it's gonna take a long time to ultimately resolve. Um, but again, it just stresses that um, hacking is, is a large part of this picture. And then insider threats, loss, or, or other kind of categories or unknown categories as, as representing um, roughly the other half. I mentioned at the beginning, some things are getting a lot better, some things are getting a lot worse, and, and hacking is definitely one of these things that's getting a lot worse. Uh, the healthcare industry experienced another alarming increase in hacking incidents in 2019, increased consistent with the uh, worrisome year-over-year -year trend since 2016. So it's just um, compounding every year, it's getting, getting larger and larger. A lot of this is due to um, uh, innovations in technology on the healthcare front, but it's also because of the uh, kind of trend in success. And I think a lot of hackers are seeing that uh, how easy it is to infiltrate a health system and the benefit of it, which is drawing more, more and more vulnerability to the healthcare industry. They were, uh, hacking incidents were relatively constant throughout the year uh, with a total of 330 incidents in 2019, comprising about 58% of all breaches that we saw in previous slides. Like overall incidents throughout the year on the monthly uh, view that I showed earlier, um, you know, there's not a real trend here. Uh, it also appears um, hacking incidents, particularly ransomware incidents are on the rise. Hackers are getting more creative in their exploits with healthcare organizations uh, and patients alike in contrast to previous uh, incidents. Um, and, and, you know, in the past we've seen where hackers uh, maybe are not successful with ransom de demands, they're publicly dumping the data, they refuse to pay. We're, that is also something we're seeing get worse. Breaking down um, the types of, of hacking between um, extortion, phishing, ran ransomware, malware, and, and other categories. You could say that there might be some seasonality trend here, but I'd encourage you to disregard some of the patterns um, on the quarter to quarter breakdown. Statistically, um, the, the probability of this happening across the year is really evenly distributed, and I think you're um, just as likely to be exposed to any one of these hacking threats um, any time of year. We really don't see a seasonality um, to this data. So while hacking is getting worse, overall the number of insider-related incidents has de decreased year over year since 2016. Uh, we are seeing that this is largely due to the adoption of technologies like healthcare compliance analytics um, and health systems across the country and improved employee education on how to prevent privacy violations overall. So a number of things are contributing to this, but either way you can see that these numbers speak for themselves in that, that this is an improving um, improving aspect of this data. We know that um, patient education and healthcare compliance analytics is a big driver to this improvement because in addition to the breach barometer, our company also produces uh, reports often in collaboration with Synergistic um, that we call the Privacy Health Checkup, which is actually a breakdown and analysis of a single organization's records uh, and, and their exposure over um, periods of time. And so what we do is we look at an organization's data and the volume of breaches that they've either detected or not detected that has been discovered by AI retrospectively. Uh, and we can compare that to um, 
peer benchmarks or industry benchmarks. And what we're seeing consistently is, is organizations that have really good privacy and security programs are massively contributing towards the decline on insider threats. Across the board, we see customers generally trend down, but when we come into an organization that maybe hasn't invested as much into their privacy and security programs, we see that it's actually getting worse. Um, so I believe that actually why the overall trend is decreasing, we're seeing a much better picture with some organizations, an even more rapid trend down, uh, where other organizations are getting worse because they're not investing into um, the appropriate levels of, of um, privacy monitoring or protection of patient records. So even with the decrease of the number of insider incidents, uh, they still pose an, a significant threat uh, with one insider related incident going undetected for about seven years. In this particular incident, seven, uh, sensitive patient information was viewable to external audiences outside their system network. Potentially exposed information included patient name, medical record number, insurance information, appointment times, and procedure information. So really immutable data that, that um, could be used in a number of, of nefarious ways. At this time though, it does not appear that data has been used maliciously and the organization has corrected the system configuration because of their ability to respond um, to the threats quickly. Several other insider uh, related incidents went undiscovered through three or more years, putting significant amounts of patient data at risk. When we compare um, the insider threat between insider wrongdoing and insider error, you can see that the volume of insider error is much higher than insider wrongdoing. So while, um, sorry, I'm gonna jump around here. Um, what it, the, the interesting thing that this tells me is that a lot of insider wrongdoing is certainly not high volume like we see with um, hacking events where with hacking you know we saw that um, figure where you know over half of the the records uh, was due to one incident with 11.9 million of those records coming from one covered entity insider threats tend to be much more focused um, and on individual records that being said i want to keep in mind that when we pull data from health and human services we are looking at the greater than 500 um records breached, um, the less than 500 reports. Uh, we have submitted FOIA requests to Health and Human Services to be able to view that data, but they have not released information on that data. So we think that this is um, well underrepresented and, and I'm sure many privacy officers that are part of this um, uh, attendee um, group today would agree that this number is probably a lot higher not only based off of not seeing that data, but also what, what get, goes undetected. We also see a, a large volume of air um, increasing um, with the, the, the rollout of, of healthcare compliance analytics. And this is one of the interesting things that um, we're able to work with our, between our partnership between Pertenis and Synergistic and, and address. When AI is running through all of your activity and identifying a lot of behaviors, not all of it is people snooping in medical records or stealing data. A lot of it is workflows or practices that are not being established or, or um, adhered to in an effective way. And so when you have um, maybe a department that is not using the right search criteria to go into a patient record or you know, constantly um, exposing types of information through a, a protocol that just uh, should not be in place. Those are the things that through the right recommendations or the right tweaks to your policies, you can actually have a massive impact. And we've seen organizations, you know, flip on the Pretendus platform and find, you know, hundreds of incidences happening a day, make a couple tweaks, and then see that number drop down to a much more manageable level really quickly because you can address that um, kind of systemic uh, issue rather than the individuals who are doing the more nefarious activity. Um, so this is why it's really valuable to, to work with an organization like Synergistic. It's not just about the technology you put in place, it's really about the holistic platform you build um, around it as well. 
I did want to talk about one incident um, that happened in 2019 where a nurse was suspected of gaining access to patient information and providing the data to a third party for fraudulent purposes. This is actually a Maryland-based healthcare, so not far from where Pertenis is headquartered. Um, but the organization discovered the breach when law enforcement reached out after the employee's associate uh, was arrested for an unrelated matter. So again, it's unfortunate that detection was actually occurring outside of the organization and being reported back to it rather than detected through proactive um, monitoring. It was estimated that about 16,500 um, uh, patients could have been affected over the course of almost two years. So it was actually 644 days where this went uh, before it was discovered. And then based on the information provided by state and local law enforcement, the organizations fired this employee, reported the incident to the Board of Nursing, um, and ultimately the investigation is still ongoing, unfortunately. But the addition of the loss of patient trust, in addition to the uh, loss of patient trust due to this, this entity may now be facing substantial post-breach costs, um, estimated at being close to um, $10 million for this incident, if not more, which is the average per breach. So again, even though we're seeing um, an improvement with the insider threats, we think it's not a full snapshot for every organization. And we think that this is something that, that can still cost devastating damages uh, compared to the large hacking incidences that are occurring frequently as well. I've mentioned a number of, of statistics when it comes to detection. I've, I've, I've showcased um, some really long periods of time that it's taken to um, resolve cases. Several insider threats uh, took more than four years to discover. The last one I mentioned was about two years. Overall, the number of insider related incidents has decreased, but, um, and this is largely, we believe, again, due to healthcare compliance analytics, but it's clear that um, uh, when you have situations that are occurring this long, um, it, it's just a matter of time before new incidences are, are going to pop up that were not detected before. On average, looking at all of our data in the breach barometer for 2019, the, the average detection time was 224 days, but the median was 44 days. Um, and so for, for those not um, in statistics every day, the fact that the median is much lower than the average means that there's a shift and a long tail. Um, so half of the incidents were resolved in 44 days, a little over a month, um, but uh, there was a really long tail that's pulling that average out where some are gonna be four plus uh, and, and really stretch out these numbers and, and ha have an overall impact. The median we're seeing go down as organizations are getting more savvy on, on detection and, and resolving this. We also think that healthcare compliance analytics is, is contributing to this. In our customer base, uh, I believe the average resolution time is about 28 days, and that's an average, not a median. Um, I think our median is a bit below that as well. So having the right um, technology place and the right program in place really does have an impact in terms of staying on top of detection, but also just being consistent in the resolution approach and time. So um, while hacking incidents um, may be discovered more quickly than insider incidents and persist a long time, they also tend to have longer gaps between discovery of the breach and reporting it. This may be to do the fact that a ransomware attacks making it more difficult to determine what may have been accessed or exfiltrated, uh, making it harder to identify and notify. Um, so if you don't have the right uh, e-discovery or forensics tool in place or the right team to, to investigate exactly what happened, um, it can be very difficult to put together the full story and, and you really don't want to start to report if you don't have a full picture of, of what happened. So hopefully this question um, does not need, we don't need to spend a lot of time justifying this question. Clearly privacy monitoring is, is a critical aspect to protecting patient records. On average, when uh, our company engages with a health system, we see that the average hospital generates about 60 million access logs, but only audits about a thousand. And so the difference in magnitude there is 
so large that it would take an astronomical number of, of workforce members or analysts to be able to audit every single access to every single medical record every single day. And the result of that is that most breaches go unnoticed. If you're only looking at the tip of the iceberg, it's impossible to determine how bad the problem is. And also a lot of your time and energy may be directed towards events that are not as systemic or, or um, lead you towards initiatives that aren't as impactful. I mentioned earlier that a lot of the, um, the biggest impacts are not necessarily dealing with one-off employees who are snooping, it's actually some of the systemic trends um, that are exposing patients through errors or, or sloppy practice. Uh, and so the only way to really see the full shape of the iceberg is to leverage AI to audit every access to every record every day, and then use that information to paint the full picture of the iceberg so that you can strategically address um, areas of your organization to have the biggest impact. We've seen this play, um, play roll out in a number of organizations and consistently it, it reduces the volume of, of privacy incidents significantly over time and really just creates a better culture of, of compliance overall. We've seen organizations build effective privacy programs um, and, and taking the, um, you know, there's a number of ways to do it, but we think there's a general structure to building out this uh, approach. Um, so there are several steps in this. So what we're gonna do now is shift from talking about the pri um, um, breach barometer data to a couple practical applications of building an effective privacy monitoring program. Um, ultimately, you want a program that's geared towards educating workforce and preventing violations, not just responding to them or investigating them after they've been detected by other means. Um, it, it's it's a quite a number of steps to be able to get there because uh, of the amount of, of incidences being reported through compliance hotlines or by being detected by outside parties. You really need a way to uh, have a more efficient system of responding to those reactive cases, but a, a, a dedication towards shifting towards being proactive and preventative as as well. So the first step to this, we're going to talk about a couple of these steps. The first step is being able to centralize all audit log onto a central platform to give you that single pane of glass. Common practice here is you're going to have data distributed across your medical record system, peripherals. You're going to have data sharing platforms through like HIEs. Um, doing e-discovery on this between like current systems and legacy systems uh, legacy systems can be a nightmare. Um, it, it calls, it requires pulling in IT and database admins, pulling together information. And sometimes the most difficult part of these uh, investigation investigatory process are the reconciliation or the indexing of different data sets together. So for example, if you have a user ID in one system, how do you know that's the same user access in, in another system? And this is, uh, in, in my opinion, the single largest value of having a compliance analytics platform is it's bringing all of that information together and creating a canonical record of every single individual, not a user, but an individual. So if I'm Nick and I have one username on Epic and another on Cerner and another on Pixis, all of those systems are gonna be tied back to one user. And through that single pane of glass, you're gonna understand what I've done across multiple systems so that you're not limited. Um, so many times we see information that may be really curious, like why is this person in this record? Why are they looking this up? And then suddenly you look at time card data or dispensing cabinet data and you see, wait a minute, this person actually is involved with care of this person. And it helps vindicate and, and not spend time chasing after a wild goose chase because you have all that information together already tied. So rather than waiting for the incident and then doing the e-discovery and bring it together, the compliance platform is doing that e-discovery on every access to every record every day, indexing all the information and tying it together so that when you do your investigation, it's already connected um, and you're able to, to, to draw lines from one data set to another and see that full picture. 
And being empowered with all the information at your fingertips really allows you to, to leverage that information. And this brings us to uh, the, the second approach, which is really leveraging that data um, and, and using it to not only speed up your, your um, investigation time and resolve time, but build consistency around your, your policies and procedures. Again, this is where uh, we really value the partnership that we have with, with Synergistic because you can't just buy the tool and put it in place and say, okay, we're checking the box, we're done. Uh, it's really how you use the tool and how you incorporate it to other workflows. Uh, I've seen this played out with relationships with HR, relationship with leadership and, and management, even how certain policies are written. In fact, we encourage a lot of our customers to look at their policies and, and tweak them to take advantage of some of the automation you can um, place in, in our, our platform so that you're going through cases faster uh, and more effectively. I'll share an anecdote on this that I, I um, is, is one of my favorites because it's one of the least complicated, um, lowest technology parts of our um, uh, platform, but it's had such a big impact. So uh, we talked to a number of customers that were that were not really focused on family member snooping. They really wanted to see the the high um, risk, you know, coworker snooping, VIP snooping, data theft, repeat offenders, other categories that they were more concerned about. But what's troubling is when we did their privacy health checkup, we saw that you know this this large volume of family member snooping that they just didn't have the time to address. And so we asked them, you know, what what's your concern there? And they said the reality is. It takes so much time to adjust each one of those. There's so many of them. Um, you know, we're hoping we can just through education encourage people not to do it and see it drop down, and we're just going to monitor it. But every time we reach out, um, all that's going to happen is we're going to slap the person on the wrist, and we're we're going to move on from there because it's not really the most risk. And oftentimes they have permission from the patient, and it's just about getting the, the legal purposes. I'm paraphrasing here. Um, but but the point was it was such a hard volume, vol such a large volume, and they wanted to dedicate their their time and energy elsewhere. So what we did is is after a couple of discovery calls and and kind of product design meetings, we came up with a way where we could automatically email these workforce members after they've accessed the family member when we knew it wasn't a high risk case. We knew it was something that was um, probably benign, like an employee looking at their mom's record or the spouse's record, providing kind of advice or guidance, still a policy violation, still inappropriate, but not something that would um, always result in, in, a, in a huge investigation or, or um, case resolve. And so what we did is uh, we came up with this template where the AI would take the information and reach out to the person and say, dear so-and-so, um, you know, we, we've identified you accessing your spouse, your mother, whatever it is on this date. This is in violation of our policy. You know, please respond to this message and, you know, let us know why you've done it. Please don't do it again. Here's your link to our policy. And because this was templatized and they had a very clear algorithm of how to respond to these, some of them actually resulted in, in a breach notification. Some of them um, resulted in like deeper investigations, but the majority of them were just corrective actions taken on the spot. Manager was notified. And then each of those individuals was monitored um, continuously to see if they repeated the offense. So when we first rolled this out, and this, this case study has been presented at HIMSS and some other um, uh, conferences, and would happy to be share the case study with you guys. But what we found was that in a controlled setting, if you got an email, you had about a 2% chance over the next 12 months to repeat that violation or do something worse. But if you didn't get an email and you were just left unaddressed, you actually continuously did the same thing and actually did much worse uh, over time. And, and we found that you had a 70% chance of repeating that violation within a 12 month period. So we're talking about reducing 70% chance of a repeat offense down to 2%. Um, that's significant outcomes. And the fact that the, the, you know, our customers are able to do this at scale and fire off these emails pretty consistently we see that the volume is is significantly dropping because not only you're addressing the systemic trends, but you're you're educating the workforce. It's great to have new employee training. It's great great to have annual HIPAA training. But when that employee says, "Hey, Nick, we saw you do this thing," 
you perk up a little bit more and you are more aware of what's appropriate. Yeah, our customer is showing us some of the emails they got back of people saying, oh my gosh, I didn't know, I'm so sorry. It's like, how did you not know? We've told you this so many times, but it didn't stick until it really applied to them. So that's just an example. And it really points out that most of that effort did not come from just turning on the system and having it run. It really came to what the program was that was built around the platform that was so critical. And it was how they orchestrated with leadership, how they, they changed their policies and procedures and how they fine tuned their workflows to have that impact. Um, so I can't stress enough. It's, it's really how you leverage that data um, and how you um, run through that information to provide the, the ultimate picture. There's a lot of steps in, in building an effective program. We don't have time to go through every single step. Um, and you know it's also really dependent on what type of organization you have. Um, I do wanna jump ahead towards some of the later stage. Um, you know, we've, we talked at the beginning about some of the, the celebrities or um, local um, news events that might uh, pull your um, organization in. It's funny, every time I watch the news about a person, a notable person, you know, whether it's Hillary Clinton, Supreme Court justice, movie star, athlete, um, anytime there's anything mentioned of a, of a medical condition or uh, an accident, an injury, I always think that person's probably been to a lot of hospitals. They've probably been to a lot of um, clinical uh, settings where their information is stored. I wonder how many employees are, are looking at those records and if where that record is housed is using a system to monitor every access we're, we're going to be able to identify and contain um, that event but um, if you're not leveraging that platform not monitoring uh, it, it can go undetected and so while we talked about kind of the large volume of benign incidents like family member snooping being able to bring in that publicly available data like social media trends or news trends really helps protect against um, some of these bigger risk uh, um, compliance issues as well. So I know I talk fast, um, but I, I really hope that um, in our conversation today, we've been able to see how healthcare compliance analytics lets you see the entire picture and not just um, uh, the tip of the iceberg. We've seen that there's been an increased adoption in healthcare compliance analytics that allows you to see everything to that single pane of glass. Um, having uh, all of your EHR data or peripheral applications uh, at your fingertips will allow you to do more with less. And I wanna stress that in this environment, it's, it's even more important to leverage more efficient workflows. Oftentimes we see health systems um, that have, you know, a, a privacy team or an investigator team feel like they can't do everything um, with the time and day and then facing furloughs or maybe budget cuts uh, makes it even harder. But with our customers, when they employ the, the AI, what's really great about this is that even if you have to take time off or even if your staff is out for a couple of days, you still have the AI running. It also allows you to kind of tune up and down your workload based on, on what's available and, and focus on, on the bigger picture. And so as a result, um, maybe through a couple of policy actions, you're able to really reduce the, the overall threat over time rather than throwing your staff at kind of responding to every single incident that's detected and, and going around and, and reinforcing or terminate employees. And that's really the thing that is most rewarding for me in this is that I hate to see our platform terminate uh, employees over and over again. Um, you know, healthcare workers are traditionally overburdened, under-resourced, uh, understaffed. It's very difficult, um, emotionally challenging work. And when you have all of this exposure to data, which is a unique challenge in healthcare, when you're able to have all this information at your fingertips, when you're caring and benevolent, you want to just reach out and help someone. And maybe you want to bend the rules to, to get information and share that information and, and be helpful. It's just too easy to slip up. And when you have a compliance program that gives you the full picture and allows you to focus on prevention, you're actually saving that person from just making a little mistake that could cost them their career. Uh, and I know you guys probably have lots of examples of seeing people 
throw away years of education and, and training because they just made you know a, a simple mistake or, or thought they were not being detect monitored and and um, went off the handle on, on doing something they really shouldn't have. Uh, and so if you're reacting to every incident, every case is just going to resolve in, in either termination or some kind of um, um, sanctions or, or a response that employee to, to make sure it doesn't happen again. But when you shift your program towards prevention and you, you think about on the spot in uh, education for low risk events, or you think about maybe workflow changes or, or setting uh, better policies on how people should be opening medical records or, or rules to enforce that, you really can actually help um, reduce the number of, of consequential um, events like terminations and, and create that culture of compliance for your organization, which I know is, is all of our goal. So just to summarize the key takeaways here, uh, we talked about the health data security landscape. Uh, it goes without saying that I mean, it's, it's healthcare is a, it is a high risk, high profile um, area for hackers uh, uh, and, and ransomware. But also that insider threat is still not something to be dismissed. The fact that um, healthcare providers have so much access to information, uh, so much unfettered access across the organization just makes it really difficult to understand the full scope because so much goes um, beneath the radar and is unnoticed. So we hope that our, our breach barometer is, is uh, helping us get that bigger picture. But the other part is putting in place a, a practical um, platform, like a privacy monitor platform, like a pro tennis platform, to be able to see all that information and actually do something with it and leverage the, the data and the insights to have, um, have a better impact um, for your organization overall. If you'd like to read the full breach uh, barometer, we didn't have a chance to go through everything um, in the in the entire report. Uh, we've gotten a lot of tremendous feedback on this. We think it's very helpful. I encourage you to go to our website uh, or just search on Google breach barometer. It should pop up pretty quickly. Um, I, I'd also, uh, if anyone is curious about comparing the breach barometer to your own organization or interested in the privacy health checkup, this is something um, our partners with Synergistic can help with. So I encourage anyone to ask about that. So with that, I will turn it over um, and pull in Michelle, and we will be happy to answer any questions that you guys have during the presentation. Thanks, Nick. And thanks so much for your overview very helpful great information i do have some questions for you so one of the audience members had um, touched on your family member comment and wanted to ask you why do you think family member snooping is benign great question um i also just flipped back to the uh the platform that we're using to present this and i saw so many people got their question at the beginning right between the the uh, three celebrities uh Congratulations, all of you. Most of you said COVID, although one person said rich, and that's not wrong either. We all have rich in common. So Michelle, that's a great question. Why is family member um, snooping benign? It isn't at all. Um, you know, I, I think of everything as on a spectrum to benign and, and high risk, and you really don't know where it's gonna fall unless you have all the information. Uh, I, I'm sure everyone in this meeting has their own anecdote, but I've just heard the, the craziest of situations where, you know, there's a divorce and a love triangle and, you know, alimony and, and child custody battles where, you know, you get tied up where the person is in the medical record and see something they shouldn't have saw. And it's a significant um, incident that needs to be reported. There could be lawsuits. Um, you know, there could be complaints. There could be people losing their licenses um, or be reporting to, to, uh, to the board of ethics. So they can be really devastating. That being said, when we look at the volume of family member snooping, uh, we have found by far most people accessing their family member's record are doing it benevolently. They are compassionate and they want to help out maybe um, a significant other or grandparent or someone who's going through complicated care. Um, they feel like they can help translate. Um, they feel like they don't need to go through the right protocol or hospital setup on how they should access that, getting the right authorization, using things like my chart or, or the right pathways. And so because there's such a high volume of incidences that are low risk and, and um, benign, 
that's why setting up a, a protocol of either education or reinforcing the appropriate ways will have that bigger impact um, and help you focus on the ones that really do matter. Like if you could spend time on those incidences that could turn into lawsuits, that's so much better than spending time on you know, talking to the person who actually had verbal permission by their by their spouse to look at their record and they just needed to get the documentation or it wasn't filed correctly or um, or, or whatnot, where it's really just a matter of going through the motions to correct that, that misstep. Let me ask a question that was just posed that is um, tangential to this, where we're talking about um, one of our audience members said the example of a family member record um, viewing seems reactive. Any thoughts on how the same um, could be applied to the actual time of access to proactively block it entirely, like how a fraudulent credit card transaction is declined? I'd like to see the single pane of glass, how that would help enable this. Yeah, it's such a great question. It's something we think about a lot um, at for tennis. There's, in general, there's this, um, um, two set system that's really pulling tension on itself. In healthcare, you want to share all the information so that it's available at your fingertips in any system that prevents a doctor or nurse or provider from accessing the information they need in an emergency is gonna be ripped out. You can't block people from information in a life-saving measure. If you're blocked from your credit card and you can't buy Chick-fil-A for lunch, that's a real inconvenience. It could even be devastating in some instances, but it's much better than having someone steal all your money and you'd much rather have your credit card frozen on the spot or you'd much rather have to go through the, the hassle of calling um, you know, your credit card company to open that up. So because of the change, the difference um, in the industries, you really don't want something that defaults to closing it off. That being said, um, you know, we also don't want people just to have unfettered access. We don't want people to just have the ability to do whatever they, they want in the medical record. And so there are some interesting opportunities to maybe be a little bit more thoughtful and, and interdict. We know that some medical record systems have things like uh, break the glass protocols, which can be a nuisance in their, in their own way, depending on how they're rolled out. But we have seen some um, policies and procedures set up to where they are used effectively and, and maybe having a double step of having to authenticate while you're going in does um, create some, some better protocols. So our artificial intelligence, we see improving constantly year over year. We see our accuracy constantly going um, uh, in the right direction. At this point, we have an average of 89 uh, 90 percent uh, across our customer base and, and my hope is that when we get to a point where it's accurate enough we can partner with medical record systems to maybe integrate with like a grass or, or create some kind of stop that would be more um more direct as the point of entry and, and be able to prevent that person from doing something nefarious we're unfortunately not there and if you have a system that's blocking people out when they need to uh, get into the record that's just going to create a lot of contention for, for our care provider. Mm -hmm. So two more questions, Nick, thank you very much. Um, we, with respect to customer relations management, CRM, um, one of your competitors just announced an agreement with CRM uh, system vendor to do monitoring around consumer customer data. Do you think more of this is coming as states enact more privacy regulations and will pretend move into that space as well? You know, our goal is, is to build a platform that's able to analyze uh, any access to sensitive information, whether that's through a, um, a consumer or, or a um, business associate or a covered entity. So we do have that vision of a one core platform um, to, to monitor everything. I do think it's important. Um, I'd also comment that hospital systems in general or health providers in general have so many different threats um, and so you know it's it's really difficult to build out a system that protects everything at one time and you have to think about building that layered approach um, to building up your pro privacy and security monitoring program over time it's all in the details of the data right exactly <laughs> didn't mean to minimize it but for sure devils in the details so another question for you sir um, security network monitoring benefits from correlation 
performed by an active monitoring partner. Does this also apply to privacy monitoring? Do we learn more when looking at things in the aggregate and being able to correlate the data? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we got a lot of our um, uh, best practices from the cybersecurity um, uh, industry being located in Baltimore. Baltimore has a rich um, ecosystem of cybersecurity um, agencies, DOD, three letter agencies, um, government contractors that specialize in that kind of work. And so a lot of our data science and engineer team came from that background. And as a result, we really kept in mind how to leverage insights and constantly improve, improve the platform. And so the trick with healthcare is you can't share data from one system to another um, uh, without the appropriate provisions in place. And we don't want to share customer data from one site to another. That being said, you uh, the, the insights um, can be extrapolated from the data and applied to other um, learning modules. And so rather than just having a training set that, that's focused on your organization, you can bring in insight from other organizations to benefit from that as well. Um, and so, for example, one organization in Connecticut could have a, uh, a new type of uh, phishing attack that's been detected or a new type of nefarious activity where someone is pulling out lots of driver's license or, or a really unique behavior that doesn't happen commonly. You don't want to wait for your organization to have that happen um, to be able to train the AI. You want to just benefit from that known occurrence and, and, and leverage that um, machine learning ability your your information so i think it's really important to um, share those best practices i also think it's not um not only important for uh the technology to learn from various systems that incorporate that but i also think it's really important that systems are talking to each other that's why events like this one or, or we host a number of uh, user group conferences as well have being able to come together and talk to other systems about what they're working on and what their challenges are um, it's not just sharing the AI intelligence, it's sharing the, the subject matter expert intelligence and how they're deploying the AI as well. Excellent. I have a question, Nick, as it relates to kind of present day or present year, thinking about um, the Pretenus platform and, and the COVID monitoring, the VIP monitoring. Um, I know that you were sharing with us some information from years past. Any insights that you can offer on what you've been seeing as it relates to uh, clients looking for that particular monitoring, any spikes or any increase in, in data metrics that might be worth sharing with the team? I think it's too early to tell for sure. Um, I do um, expect we're gonna see in the 2020 breach report a lot of um, increasing uh, consequences. We share in, in our Slack channel different um, you know, announcements or organizations that have been hit by a breach. And, you know, just looking at the volume of that, we're seeing that increase. I mentioned earlier, Synergistic has put out some, some reports, some early signs on this, and we're seeing that trend start to build. Mm -hmm. um, I know many customers have talked to us about this. In fact, back in March, when this firm rolled out, we added on a module um, to our platform where you could connect COVID um, patients uh, and flag them, uh, basically treat them as, as VIPs and have a higher level of security on that. Uh, we've gotten some feedback that that's been very effective, um, being able to, to monitor those individuals. And then we've talked to other organizations where it really is about the systemic changes. Uh, I mentioned the dashboards that were linking to patient records and making it just super easy with one click. You could open up and see who's been diagnosed with COVID and get all of their information. And you know, with just a little change, they made it you know restricted so you could see the dashboard, but you wouldn't be able to get to the patient records right from the dashboard. Mm -hmm. And that was able to cut down and it, of the um, inappropriate accesses as well. Yeah, it's it's interesting to think you touched earlier on culture of uh, culture of compliance, and perhaps based on where organizations are in their level of maturity, um, could have had little to no impact on COVID monitoring because they already had that established culture of compliance, and they were just continuing on with their ongoing monitoring. Excellent. Well, we're coming to the end of our show, and Nick, thank you very much. This has been an excellent discussion. Always appreciate your insight. Um, helping us see the whole story. These are all critical elements as folks work to present good information on the known risks. 
So I'll just- No, thank you. I really appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Just calling the audience's attention to the polling section. There is one question, if you wouldn't mind submitting, how did we do? And again, Nick, thank you for your time. And I wish everyone a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of the summit.